Good morning, Gordon. I'm going to put my glasses on, but it looks like this place fills up pretty good. Thank you for coming this morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you during homecoming, this period of coming home where current students and alumni uh, can remember everything that's right about Gordon, what's best about Gordon, about celebrating life together in Christ, about being in relationship with each other, about having fun and food and friendship and fellowship uh, together rooted in Christ. If there's one place on this planet where people can come together rooted in each other because they're rooted in Christ, it's, it's Gordon. This is your history. This is what you steward. This is what the world needs now. This is a place where you learn to be the church. You learn to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And it is a very precious thing that you steward together as you come home, come home to Jesus and come home to each other in this context. I'm afraid as a result that what I say to you this morning is not going to be anything new. For again, if any place on the planet knows what it means to edify and equip his church, his followers to engage his world, it's Gordon. This is the place, and it's a special place. So I hope that my words, in other words, will renew that call. And I hope that my words today will be with you as you think about what it means to steward this place and to steward this call, and that you will run and not grow weary toward the call that God has given each of you. Not because of the call, but because of the one who calls. And he calls us all. And our job is to glorify his name in every vocation and location. So with that, let me open us up again with prayer and come to that spot where we think about such things together. Lord, Lion of Judah, a bruised reed you will not break. We are thankful for the opportunity to gather freely, to call upon your name, fully aware that your body is being persecuted this day, this hour, this minute, that your followers do not have the same freedom to come together and wrestle with the things of life because they are being persecuted. And we also are aware, Lord, that all those who are not yet included in your kingdom who bear your image are also being persecuted and that we glorify your name when we work for them to live in safety and to choose freely a faith. So amidst these difficult times, Lord, give us and grant us wisdom and understanding, knowledge and discernment. Grant us vision and patience. Grant us leadership and judgment. Give us grace and peace and discipline to do the right thing the right way at the right time. And may we love as you first loved us. May we forgive as you first forgave us. May we submit as you first submitted. And may these words, these words this day be your words for your people. Amen. These are serious times, folks. I don't know if you saw the news. Terrible things are happening in Oregon. Seems to be a pattern. Terrible things are happening in the Middle East. And we need uh, people, we need Gordon graduates who understand what it means to steward your faith uh, in every, every sphere, in every vocation, every location. A term that you are going to hear me say many times today because I believe that is what the body of Christ is and is called to do. And if the last best hope for the world is the church itself, in my anecdotal observation, generally speaking, if the last best hope for the world is the church itself, the church itself is ill-equipped for these times. It's ill-equipped because I think 
we've lost the capacity to disciple. We've lost the capacity to disciple, and an undiscipled church is an unprophetic church. An unprophetic church is incapable of making the timeless message timely for our times. Which is also to say that the church would be irrelevant, even assuming that it could propose a secular solution, because there's nothing to distinguish it from the secular solutions being presented for these complex challenges that we face domestically and overseas. Now, I've made a lot of assumptions in those opening remarks, and let me, since we are in an academic setting, give you some terms of reference that uh, you may not find in any textbook, but they're mine. <laughs> so you can roll with it and see what you think, and you can challenge or rebuke me later on them. But I want you to be clear about how I'm using some terms. The first term is church. What is the church? The church, to me, is the perfectly prepositioned body of believers in every vocation and location worldwide ready to spread the message. The perfectly prepositioned body of believers in every vocation and location. What is the message? The message is Jesus. <laughs> What's beautiful about Jesus is that the message never changes. The message essentially is no me. The methodology always changes according to the context and to the person. Paul summarizes it best. 2 Timothy 2.8 Remembering Christ Jesus raised from the dead Descendant of David, this is my gospel. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the God of history is operating through time and space, which he created, and he gave an Old Testament or an Old Covenant that required a new covenant and a new priesthood, a Davidic line, the son of David, as Matthew says, descendant of David, and he comes back, and he, or he comes, and he sacrifices his life and makes a perfect gift and a perfect sacrifice so that all Gentiles and Jews can be included in the kingdom. That's the message. It's a powerful thing. It's relevant on the cruel edges of the world if we let it be. What's the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church, to my mind, is to disciple its followers. And by disciple, I mean this, to theologically edify and practically equip the body of believers such that they can engage his world. Theologically equip and theologically edify and practically equip the body of believers in their respective vocations and locations to engage his world, a world that he so loved. He wants us to engage innocently. He wants us to engage shrewdly. Matthew 10, 16, and he wants us to engage excellently. This is the purpose of the church, and to be a fragrant and familial testimony to the hope and home within that is Jesus the message. Descendant of David, raised from the dead, this is my gospel. And if we're discipling, if the church is discipling itself, then the church is also arriving at a point where you can discern some of the following things. That we are called to be obedient, not successful. Sometimes they overlap, but we are called to be obedient first. We are called to engage the world not to change it, but because we are changed. If we have been discipled, we can discern that we are all missionaries. All missionaries. Our vocation and location, but the excuse to show the love of Christ. And if we are discipled, we can discern that excellence is evangelism. That in a mediocre world, our excellence in the vocations and locations that we've been given will attract others to us and provide an opportunity to share the love of Christ, sometimes using words. And you, Gordon, you're the church. Look around you. You wonder what the church is? You're looking at it. Don't be afraid. Look to your left and right. You are the church, you are the body of believers, you are being perfectly prepositioned through the vocations and 
academic disciplines that you are being prepared with now, theologically equipped, practically, theologically edified, practically equipped to engage his world. You don't ask, what would Jesus do? You're going to ask, what is he doing, and how can I come alongside that? That's what it means to be the church. That's what it means to be in a safe space that is Gordon to have these kinds of conversations. Because Christ is our home and because our job is to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Now that famous theologian Mark Twain once said that uh, he never let his schooling interfere with his education. Schooling's important. But if you're the church and this is a Christian university, a Christian college, then your schooling is but one means of discipleship to prepare you to engage his world, prepare you to embrace a hurting world. That's the mission of the church. Now, I didn't always have this opinion, and you're welcome to disagree with me. Uh, but this opinion started to form as I look back on my own life when our family moved away from New England. This is my kind of homecoming too. I grew up in Attleboro, down the road, and then we moved to Barrington, Rhode Island, across the way, following in the footsteps of Roger Williams, whom I had never heard of until I started working for our organization. And uh, I have seen New England at its best. I've climbed Mount Monadnock and seen the majestic foliage. I have been to L.L. Bean and made my pilgrimages at midnight. I have skied and been on youth group trips all over the mountains of Vermont and, and New Hampshire. I love this place. I love this place. Uh, I know the joys of shopping at Star Market and uh, living in a triple deca in Medford and Winter Hill. I love that. I've experienced the mystery of driving in Boston where it's, ex it's like giving information to the enemy to use your turn signal. And many times I have experienced the customer service of walking into a store of, what do you want? And I have experienced the wandering soullessness of wondering when Boston sports teams would win again, suffering through the Red Sox seasons, looking for a pennant anywhere, and two and 14 seasons with the Pats and Steve Grogan. Boston was not always so blessed, I want you to know. Although the Red Sox needing three games to finish at 500 is a reminder of the times we suffered through. In Rhode Island, I went to this incredible church, uh, Barrington Baptist, and uh, my world was whole and integrated. All of my friends and family went to the church. We did youth group stuff together. It was uh, just an absolute blessing. It was the best of being in a suburban cocoon, if you can say something like that these days. It was just fantastic. But what I did not know when uh, I left Barrington and we moved to Philadelphia for my sophomore year of high school, what I did not know was that my faith was a little bit more of a formula than a fragrance. I was saved, I knew I was going to heaven, but I didn't get things like 2 Timothy 2.8. Well, that's nothing against the church that I went to or my family. For whatever reason, I just, Mr. Magoo missed that whole thing. Didn't get it. And so when we moved to Philly, I started to separate and segregate my worlds and started seeing myself as less and others as less and my God as less than what was intended. Don't get me wrong, I was a happy Christian. Happy Christian, happy to do church stuff on Sunday, but just as happy to become a six-day secularist Monday through Saturday. I was happy to have a fellowship hall in whatever church that I went to confident that the map of the world had little thumbtacks in it with yarn that pointed to families that our church supported and those missionaries over there did that missionary thing I have to worry about it you know I'd give some money sure not my job I'm a six-day secularist <laughs> that was a church thing and I was happy to receive presentations from those missionaries and we all knew what success was well so many people came to know Christ. Whew, glad you're there. 
Glad you're not me. I'm glad I'm not you. Good luck with that. I certainly would not know, have known what to do if the end of the missionary presentation had been something like, well, you know, we haven't converted anybody, but we feel like we're being obedient. And the thought never once occurred to me that I was a missionary. Not once. And so this pattern kind of went on for 18 years. <laughs> it's easy to get stuck in a rut, separating these things out. Again, I wasn't such a bad guy. I was a decent guy. I went to church. I loved Jesus. But I was also a walking poster child for the statement that a shallow evangelical is redundant. Fifteen years ago, we started an organization, my family did, my parents did, called the Institute for Global Engagement. And in a very poor attempt to give nepotism a good name, they hired me. And our mission statement was this, to promote sustainable environments for religious freedom worldwide and inspire and equip emerging leaders with faith-based methodologies. That sounds cool, especially sounds cool these days because it seems to be the paradigms are shifting, but nobody was talking that way back then. But for me personally, I had to begin to wrestle with what it meant to be a Christian. And I had just finished my coursework at, in Medford at the Fletcher School uh, and about to embark on a seven-year journey towards a PhD, which I wish upon no friend or enemy for that matter. And my field was international affairs, so, you know, I had to have something to say about how my faith related to international affairs, and I didn't. I didn't know how to talk about it, didn't know how to think about it. In fact, the only way that I can sum it up looking back now is to quote a pastor from a um, reconciliation seminar that we had in Istanbul last year between Ukrainian and Russian pastors with some Central Asian pastors as well. We went through the whole two days together, and we did some talking and thinking about case studies, etc. But at the end of those two days, a Ukrainian pastor stood up and summarized what, for everybody, what everybody was thinking, and it was simply this. We don't know what to say or how to say it. Pastors did not know what to say or how to say it. They did not know how to relate their faith outside of the four walls of a building called the church. The body of Christ had been reduced to a building, and now they were completely and totally irrelevant to the complex social context of their times to include war. And that's the way I felt as we began IGE 15 years ago. I don't know what to say or how to say it. Nobody's prepared me for this. It's much easier to keep God over here and separated in those missionaries over there. And to pray for such a time as this to get that parking spot in front of Nordstrom's. That's just easier. I don't want to think about how it applies to these passions and skills and gifts that I allegedly might have. Why would I do that? But I had to because of my job. So my professional side, my integrity side that operated in my six-day secularism, Monday through Saturday, I said, hey, disciple, you better figure this out. You better break the code. And then complicating things was... Our society doesn't allow us to talk about religion and politics in polite company. How do you do that? This is all a year before 9-11, by the way. How do we do that? How do we think about that? How do we write about that? What is the scholarship uh, on that? And we were also informed by my experiences at the Fletcher School. And the Fletcher School was eye-opening in many ways because my passion of international affairs had no capacity to talk about faith. It was annoying, to say the least. And if it did talk about faith, it talked about faith or religion as part of the problem, as a catalyst to conflict. Now, the only thing more maddening than that was to try to talk within my faith about international affairs. <laughs> My faith didn't want to talk about it either because we had the, we had the, being a little bit tongue in cheek here, but we had the map down in Fellowship Hall after all, right? That's our international affairs. And so we created a journal, the Journal of uh, the Review of Faith International Affairs, which is the best journal in the world. 12 years running because it's still the only journal in the world. It's edited by the incomparable Dr. 
Dennis Hoover, who is more famous for being married to the incredible Dr. Ruth Melkonian Hoover. True friends and true relationships that uh, I appreciate, appreciate out of Gordon. In fact, that relationship is so strong that uh, Ruth was kind enough to share with me that she was not going to come to the lecture today because she had to go uh, speak at the Gordon of the Midwest, Wheaton. And, uh, and oh, by the way, would you teach my class too? <laughs> How can you not help but admire that efficiency and effectiveness? That's a friend. Uh, and if you want to come, come to Comparative Politics at 1. We're talking about China and other things. So we founded a journal to begin to talk about faith and international affairs. Uh, we created a Master of Arts in Global Engagement to try and bring these worlds together. Uh, a, a graduate degree whose time might be coming as people begin to break the code that we have to talk about faith and international affairs if you look at the headlines, if you go to the Middle East. Uh, and then we began to travel, and our context was Asian authoritarianism. We were trying to demonstrate why freedom of conscience or belief actually served the, the self-interest of the state. That when people were more civil to one another, they would be, the state would be more stable. How do you make that kind of argument? I mean, these are things that um, nobody had done before. And people would say, well, why would you even talk to the Chinese or Vietnamese communist? Why would you talk to Islamists uh, in the Middle East? My only answer to that was, hey, God said love neighbor and love enemy, and he said love enemy. <laughs> Sucks to be me, but I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to do that. And 15 years on, I will say this, having traveled in all these complex places and seen so little hope. I was in Iraq last week, the fifth time in 11 months. There's only one thing that makes sense to me, and that is our risen, reigning, and returning king, the king of history. That is the only thing that makes sense to me because states and society, institutions and individuals fail. But if you know who you are in Christ, then you will know where you're going. If you've been discipled to discern in your vocations and locations. C.S. Lewis once wrote this, I believe in Christianity because I believe the sun has risen, as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. It's a beautiful quote, you've probably heard it before. It's even more fun if you substitute sun, S-U-N, for S-O-N. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see him, but because by him, I see everything else. The scriptural basis for this, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems to be, should be true, is Psalm 36, 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. In your light, we see light. By your light, we see light. Through your light, through this prism, we see all the sectors and vocations and locations of life. It's the only way to see which means we've got to be in a right relationship with Jesus as our home on a daily basis. Our goal should be to know Jesus a little bit better today than we did yesterday so we can see by his light the different sectors, and especially the ones that we're called to. That has to be our purpose. Otherwise, you're going to be just as hopeless as everybody else in the world in these complex situations. The key to me, the key to discipleship, and the key to discerning, then, is the capacity to see. I was in Syria once, before the troubles came, and I was with some humble and devout Islamist. Sometimes it's not hard to find Waldo in the pictures that I'm in. And I was having dinner with these Islamists, and they had invited their local priest to join us. And Christians sometimes gather together, um, one, because they're Christians, two, because they tend to have more opportunity to drink wine when Islamists do not. And we began to talk, and the priest shared with me something. The priest said to me, you know, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man or woman comes to the Father except by me. He said, that was written in John. John's written 30 years after the Gospels. You really don't see that pronouncement made by Jesus in the Gospels, the three Gospels. 
you know, just between you and me over a glass of wine, maybe all Abrahamic roads lead to heaven. Why not? I wasn't ready for this conversation. I could not see it coming. I did not see a response. I had no idea how to think about it. But it challenged me. It challenged me. I hadn't been discipled in how to discern. And I really wrestled with it. I came back and three months later, I finally, the answer was finally revealed to me. You know who acknowledged Jesus for who he was in the Gospels, written 30 years before John? The demons. The demons knew who Jesus was. The, Jesus, the demons called him the son of God. That was my answer. But what it really revealed was I was completely and totally illiterate in my own scripture and therefore irrelevant to these complex contexts. It's a humbling experience. And I hope that you don't have something similar. Back to C.S. Lewis. In writing the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis paraphrases Song, Song of Solomon 6, verse 10 from the King James Version. He's writing his screw tape. If you've not come across this, I encourage you to read it someday. But screw tape is a senior demon, and he's advising his minor minions about how to take on these Christians, how to take on these people who follow Jesus. And this is what he writes. One of our great allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it's quite invisible to these humans. I was in Syria. I had no response. The church of the God of history, rooted in eternity, across time and space, was invisible. I was not prepared to be a testimony to the hope within because I had not been discipled to discern those moments and how to respond and how to use my gifts and my skills and my passions for his glory. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, do we really see things as they are? Or do we create these categories that prevent us from seeing things as they are? And by the way, the academy and theology can be guilty of this with the best of intentions. We, create, we discern, we disaggregate, we have discrete units of analysis, all for the idea of better understanding knowledge as a whole, but sometimes we don't bring it all back together. Sometimes we forget about the whole and that Jesus is the fount of all knowledge. Sometimes we are inadvertently putting the veil of Moses back over his face, coming from the glory of God in Exodus 34. Sometimes we are sewing up the holy of holies as if all ground is not holy because of what Jesus did on the cross. All ground is holy ground. The holy of holies has been torn forever. Jesus is at work in every single vocation and location. You have a new mediator and a new covenant. Descended of David, raised from the dead. He is real and he is relevant, but you have got to be in touch with him. Can you see the interruptions in your life as his purpose? Can you understand that when you're working for God, you have all the answers? Instead, you've got to work with God and let him reveal what the goals are and come alongside what he's already doing instead of asking, what would Jesus do? Some examples from Scripture. Mark 10, this is the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. We like to make this into a category, don't we? Well, all those rich people out there, they ought to just give up their money and sell it because that's what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus gave an answer that was appropriate to him. He discipled a particular person who had allowed money to become an idol and get in the way of following Jesus. We need people who make money. God bless them. As long as it doesn't become an idol, that's their gift. Go let them go do it. The same is true with you and your vocation. 
as long as it doesn't become an idol. Jesus looked at him and loved him where he was at. Luke 7, 44 through 47, this is Jesus in the home of Simon and his feet are being washed with expensive perfume. Then he turned to the woman, he's looking at the woman and he says to Simon, who has the, who's hosting the party, and Jesus says, do you see this woman? I came into your house, you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Simon saw a category. Simon saw the most marginalized woman interrupting his moment with the great teacher. He was more concerned about how he was being perceived and received by his guest than understanding what was taking place as Jesus looked at her and dis discerned and used the moment to disciple Simon. In John 4, Jesus is at the well in verse 35, and Jesus has uh, spoken to this woman in midday. She's a Samaritan woman. The, the disciples have come back, and their mouths drop open. Why is he talking to a woman in midday? Men do not do this. She happens to be a harlot. She happens to be of an, she's a half-breed because she's a, uh, from a, a Samaritan race and a different theology. I mean, Jesus is just sinning all over the place, right? And Jesus says to them, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. The disciples were on a road trip. They're at a gas station. They're going into town. Logistical stuff. It's all about us. And Jesus says, no, there is an interruption here. John 4, 4 says Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus knows what he's doing. And he's loving the most marginalized person, the most shunned person in his society. He's living out the parable of the good Samaritan by loving the bad Samaritan. And he's discipling his disciples and he disciples us through this example. And he says, I will lift her up and I will give her dignity. I will acknowledge her as made in my own image by talking to her in midday. And I'm going to stay here and I'm going to disciple the village. Please never separate justice from proclamation. You've got to do both. They're two sides of the same coin. James 2.18, I will show you my faith by what I do. Now, if you can begin to understand and see, see because you've been discipled to discern, and you begin to see the most marginalized, who can be rich people too, by the way, if it's something, something's getting in the way from them getting to know Jesus, then maybe you can begin to see the other things that are at play. And this is where you get goosebumps if you're really into this stuff. Ephesians 1.18, Paul says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. That's power. That's power. That's what you have. That's who you represent if you but claim it. And then in 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is the power. This is the real reality if you take time to be discipled so you can discern, so you can see the suffering among you, rich, poor, and marginalized, and then see the spiritual power behind you through Jesus, who is your home. It's there. It's here right now. The cloud of witnesses, past, present, and future. Right now. But remember screw tape. I don't mean the church as we see her, spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army banners. That, I confess, is terrible. But it's quite invisible to these humans. And so we have to ask ourselves, have we been edified 
and equipped to engage? Have we been discipled to discern because we realize that he is our home? When the spies come back from the land, ten spies come back from the promised land with evidence that God is a promise-keeping God, evidence of milk and honey. They're asked to give a report, and what do they say? Well, they say this, we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come out of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They're big people. I'm intimidated. I feel like a grasshopper. Therefore, they see me as a grasshopper. Guess what? Game over. That's an equation for total irrelevance. You just put your light under a bushel. But here's the problem. And this might be too glib and too general, but forgive me in advance. The church in America, we're grasshoppers worshiping a grasshopper God. We don't expect the power of chariots of fire and horses behind us. We don't expect to bring that into our vocation and location. Remember Elisha's words, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What a humble statement. It's reminiscent of what Caleb said before the grasshopper report. Let us go forth and take the land for we surely can. He doesn't reference God because God is so much a part of Caleb. Caleb's faithfulness will later be rewarded with a mountain in Hebron. And he's 85 years old. He says, bring the land of giants. Bring it on. I am still faithful and my God can still do great things through me because I believe in him. It's reminiscent of Esther, the only book in the Bible that does not mention the word God because it so permeates every single sentence and chapter of Esther. We always think about for such a time as this, but Mordecai says during the same verse just before that, if not you, Esther, someone else. But this could be your time to be obedient. This could be your time to show up and shut up and come alongside what Jesus is already doing. Does Esther come up with a three-year plan with quantifiable metrics? She stops, she fasts, and then according to the gifts and passion and vocation and location that she had been blessed with, she puts her life on the line. Which brings us back to Christian education as a lesser, lesser included set of discipleship. In the 1981 Oscar-winning movie, whose title was inspired by Elisha's Chariots of Fire, the main character, as I'm sure most of you know, was presented with a well-intentioned but false choice by his sister. Well, don't you know, Eric, you just got to go over to China and be a missionary because that's what we do. That's real service to the king. You don't want to be just a runner. That's not... Christian work, that's not missionary work, and I'm sure you've seen this, but I'll say it because you need to hear it one more time. Eric's response, at least in the movie, is, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. That pleasure is no accident. You were given specific interest and passions and skills to be made manifest in different academic disciplines here. It is the responsibility of you and staff and supporters and scholars and teachers to be in a relationship of mutual discipleship to hone and nurture those skills to prepare you to go into the world prepared for what I experienced in Syria so what happened to me does not happen to you. Only then, only then will we be a banner, an army with banners terrible unfurled across time in space such that the gates of hell do not prevail against us. So Gordon, be encouraged. You're doing this already. I encourage you to do it deeper and further. I encourage you to remember that obedience is the call, not success. That excellence is evangelism. That we're all missionaries and that you're being discipled to discern how to use your vocation and eventual location after graduation to bring glory to the king. So press on, Gordon. Keep on, Gordon. Keep on. Thank you.